Well, good evening, everybody. It is very trying times that we are in in agriculture and just in, in the world in general. I'm Susan Littlefield, Farm Director at KRVN and the Rural Radio Network, inviting you for this next hour and a half, an ability to talk about some of the things that are happening in the beef industry. And of course, to our listeners on KRVN and KTIC, thank you so much as well for joining us this evening. It is going to be a, a full informative evening. Lots of things that we'll be talking about in the industry. We have got some amazing panelists that are joining us today, including Tom Henning. We're going to start with Tom. He's an economic outlook, fiscal and monetary policy impacts on the beef industry. Some of the things that he plans to address. He's got a very strong background. So Tom, introduce yourself. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Tom Henning is my name. I'm CEO of Cashway Distributing Company in Kearney, Nebraska. The company is uh, 86 years old this year, and uh, we sell food service products, and that's probably 80% of our business, and uh, convenience store products. And the protein category is a large uh, piece of our sales. Uh, and uh, probably interesting, uh, I also raise some cattle on the side and have for the last 35 years, so uh, enjoy that piece of agriculture. I also serve on the uh, Federal Reserve Board in Kansas City, the Omaha branch, and uh, and uh, I've been on the Revenue Forecasting Board for the state of Nebraska for the last probably 11 years, and uh, then uh, I'm also on the State Chamber Board and also chair a group called uh, the One Nebraska Coalition. So I guess that's where I sp- spend my spare time. <laughs> a busy guy. Let's move over. We're going to bring uh, Jim into the conversation. Um, for folks that don't know Jim, he was a spearhead of all of this. Um, he was on the midday with us today talking about this program. And Jim, let's talk a little bit about your background. Okay, thanks, Susan, and uh, really good to be here tonight. And thank, I want to thank KRVN and that team for promoting this. Uh, uh, I'm a rancher and a restaurant operator. Of, uh, grew up in Custer County, Nebraska, near Callaway. Uh, left the state for a number of years and came back in 1996 to start Whiskey Creek Steakhouse. Uh, and after sold, uh, selling that, uh, uh, started along with several partners, uh, Skeeter Barnes. So I've had the privilege to operate both in the agricultural sector and in the restaurant sector. And uh, of course, as everyone knows, both those sectors are being hit pretty hard, especially the restaurant sector. As uh, everyone knows, uh, we've had to close our business down for the most part, except for takeout. And, uh, you know, the whole whole idea behind uh, uh, sort of, putting this panel together and with the help of KRVN was uh, understanding that we're all in this together and uh, we need to uh, help each other. Uh, We need to reach out and connect each other with the various resources that are available. And I think this panel will at least uh, uh, without having all the answers or maybe any of the answers, at least provide some perspective on uh, how we can navigate this crisis, both short-term and long-term. So really grateful p- to be here tonight. Well, thank you. We'll move on now to our next panelist. Mike Maroney is talking about some of the current cattle market fundamentals. Got lots of experience that you'll be sharing with us tonight, Mike. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, so my name is Mike Maroney. I work at Commodity and Ingredient Hedging in Chicago, so CIH. Uh, CIH is a risk management consulting firm. We work with agricultural production. So uh, I oversee our cattle and beef desk, but we also work with hog production, um, dairies, ethanol, anything that has to do with ag production, we're involved with it. Uh, My background, I started uh, at the Board of Trade in, what was it, 1996 as a runner. Uh, Ended up trading on the exchange for a number of years as a market maker, uh, and then worked through a few trading jobs in Chicago as well at some of the bigger operations there. Uh, Joined CIH in 2013, so I've been working on this for about seven years. And what we try to do ultimately is, you know, take some of the techniques and quantification uh, that the trading community in Chicago has used and make that available for the ag community as well. And last but not least is Daryl Peel, and Daryl brings a wide range of expertise to market outlooks, international trade. We know that's a very big part of this cattle industry. So, Daryl, tell us a little bit about yourself. 
Thank you, Susan, uh, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Daryl Peel. Uh, I'm a professor in the Agricultural Economics Department at Oklahoma State University. Uh, my, uh, my primary position is Extension Livestock Marketing Specialist. Uh, I've been in this position for about 30 years now, so uh, been around uh, a number of market issues over time. Certainly, this is one of the most challenging ones. I, I work in uh, overall in, in market outlook, situation and outlook, uh, risk management for cattle producers, uh, basic education. I uh, do a lot of work with the stocker industry specifically within that, uh, but also all sectors of the cattle industry. And I have done quite a bit of international work in the past. Um, in particular, I've worked in Mexico and understanding the Mexican uh, cattle and beef industry and its relationship to the U.S. industry uh, for over 25 years. So uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here tonight. We know that there's been a, a push now, I think a little bit stronger push out of Washington, D.C. and Nebraska U.S. Senator Ben Sass is he is now urging the CFTC to fight market manipulation. Uh, the way that we have seen the issues with the cattle prices as of late. Now, today it was nice to see a positive day, two days in a row. Yeah. Guys, I got my fingers crossed we can make it number three tomorrow before we head into the holiday weekend. But the fact that we got D.C. now and any one of you guys can can jump in, is that going to add pressure to what we've already seen within this these cattle market prices? Well, I guess I'll begin. Um, I think it's been a, obviously a very stressful time for everybody in the industry. Um, one of the compounding issues is the fact that in this initial run um, to get product onto grocery shelves, we've seen cutout prices trade sharply higher. Uh, the cash market has been you know, stagnant to lower and the futures exchange has looked forward and, and seen a lot of risk out there. So you've got a lot of different things moving in a lot of different directions. Um, it's been extremely challenging for everybody, but um, Ultimately, I think in the short term, the market is is reacting in a way that reflects current situation, which is that higher price in the cutout up front, and then you know uncertain terms in the future, which is what we're seeing on the board right now. Yeah, I'd echo that, Mike. I think uh, you know this. The last couple of weeks has really illustrated. Uh, first of all, you know markets work in ways that we don't always anticipate because they generally work pretty subtly. They do what they do. When we get a shock like this, we see lots of things that sometimes raises some questions. And one of those is that, uh, you know, markets uh, deal with the current situation. So we can think about supply and demand factors that are, that are driving the market right now, as you, as you said, but markets then also reflect the expectations of the future. And, and so most of the time, those two things are generally working in concert with each other. But in a situation like this, we really see very different current market situations compared to what the market's looking at ahead of time. And I think that distinction uh, between current market uh, realities and the expectations for the future is what's driving a lot of uh, what some people perceive as a real disconnect in the market right now. Uh, and one of the reasons we have futures markets in general is to try to separate current situation a little bit from uh, our expectations of the future. And so sometimes that future is doing something different than the current cash market. And again, it becomes only really apparent when we have some sort of shock like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was a real shock uh, in the supply chain uh, also, and uh, an expectation that uh, was never was never uh, really figured would happen. When the government, uh, you know, announced uh, probably in the first week in March that uh, and they were suggesting school shutdown, restaurants go on carry out only. What happened was it really shut down the food service industry. Absolutely. Really bought it to its knees. There are 660,000, uh, roughly 650, 660,000 restaurants in the United States. There's uh, over 200 and 20,000 schools. So when schools closed uh, and then when the restaurants were brought to their knees, that really put a shock in the marketplace. Uh, and most distributors, you know, usually have to place their orders a week to two weeks out. And so there was a uh, product on the truck that was coming into the food service guy. Meanwhile, uh, there's two channels out there. There's the retail channel and there's a food service channel. The retail channel wasn't braced for that. 
and they didn't have supply. And so you ended up with grocery stores uh, shelves being empty. And people really made a run on the grocery stores. Uh, And I even went to uh, the store in Broken Bow on Sunday, and I couldn't find any flour or sugar. But uh, some of the basic commodities, I mean, they really made a run on the market. Now, understanding that in food service, when you take the aggregate of restaurants, you take health care, nursing homes, hospitals, you take prisons, probably any of the non-commercial sector, that represents 54% exactly. or 54% share of the stomach. Retail uh, is about 46%. Uh, there was a time back in the 80s where it was 33% food service. When it got to 2008, 2009, uh, when the market uh, crashed, food services share went from 52% down to 48%. And in the last uh, 10, 11 years, it's gained back some market share. So that shock in the system, uh, you know, really upset, uh, upset things. And when food service comes back on, there will probably be another shock in the system. Uh, you might have heard, you might have read this last week, they were dumping milk. We sell a lot of milk to schools, and we just took our truck trucks to two or three different spots uh, uh, to a uh, number of organizations, and uh, we opened up the back door in the same way with produce. Uh, we had produce that had a limited life, and there was probably another two or three weeks uh, uh, usage there. We've got a number of uh, charities here that, uh, you know, provide meals and everything. So, you know, that was the feel-good part of that thing. But the whole supply chain was, uh, was uh, you know, really upset. And uncertainty is something the market doesn't like to see. Uh, and I, the, the uncertainty out there is probably what has uh, plagued the price points on, you know, all the commodities you've got out there. And probably the, uh, probably the commodity that uh, is concerning, too, is, uh, is oil. Uh, and uh, you look at the ethanol industry, you look at uh, the corn industry, and uh, I, I'm afraid you're going to see a lot of uh, ethanol plants that probably shut down temporarily. And uh, probably the deal between Russia and Saudi Arabia, and I understand they made some real progress on that, if they can get oil back up to 40, 45, 50 bucks a barrel, uh, that will certainly improve our economy. And especially locally, you go to western Kansas, southwest Nebraska, Alaska, Eastern Colorado, Wyoming, you get up into North Dakota, and that country depends on oil. So, no, Tom, I thought it was—I thought it was interesting as you were talking about the whole restaurant. I knew some new numbers. I don't have them in front of me, but new numbers came out today on what the COVID has in, had an impact on the restaurants. Not only the sit-down restaurants, but the fast food in in the upper seventy and eighty percent impact. So, from the financial side. The lack of being able to buy the food that they need in the future is going to have some long-term effects. It 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 will, and uh, probably in the supply chain and even the larger providers of uh, food service products, uh, you know, have really some really uh, some challenges. Uh, the large three in the industry have been off fifty percent in sales since uh, the first week in in March, which is significant. You take a fifty billion dollar company and a twenty five billion dollar company and a twenty eight billion dollar company, you know, to have an erosion of sales like that. Uh, and uh, they're still not, not out of the woods yet. So the whole supply chain, I think, is probably going to have look a little bit different when this is all said and done. And, you know, for the operator, uh, for the restaurants and everything, there's going to be some that just decide to hang it up. And uh, so the whole complexion of that industry is going to change in spite of really uh, all the government uh, stimulus dollars that they're receiving. Now, just a reminder to folks, you can uh, put your questions and your comments in and Jim and the crew there will pass along that information to our panelists. And I do have one that was just texted to me. And it's directed to Mike, and then they said after Mike answers it, everybody else can have a chance at it as well. <laughs> They're worried about the impact that the dairy industry is going to have on, on the slaughter numbers. Uh, the person went on, gentleman went on to say that he knows that some cooperatives are looking to offer early buyouts to dairy operations. He's heard it already happening in Ohio and in Wisconsin. How is that going to affect his beef prices when he sends cows or other animals to the market? 
Okay. Um, well, yeah, we have seen a significant drop in dairy prices. Um, beef, poultry, uh, milk prices have suffered with this lack of demand, no doubt about it. Uh, dairy margins had been quite appealing to producers prior to uh, this co onset of COVID-19. So, you know, at least from what we're seeing on our desk, uh, there were pretty good hedges in place for a lot of those producers, but the drop has been substantial. Uh, as those dairies become less, less profitable, what you will see is culling of the cow herd and that works its way into the beef, you know, in the beef cycle. Um, as far as how deep that impact would be, you know, frankly, I, I don't know right now. Um, you know, the big concern that everybody has is with all of these plants, 19 and with labor showing up and, you know, processing all the product that we have, uh, any additional supply is definitely, you know, going to impact us right now. We're having a hard time working through it as it stands. Additional supply will put downward pressure on the prices. All right. Anybody else like to tackle that question? You know, so, so far this year, dairy cow slaughter has been down year over year. Uh, it's been up actually the last two years. Um, beef cow slaughter has still been running strong. So if we do add a significant number of dairy cows, uh, to that mix, it will add to that cow slaughter market. And, you know, I think, again, uh, to, to agree with Mike, the, uh, the, uh, the immediate concern is just on the ability to maintain capacity at these plants. And particularly when you look at these cull cows, that's a very regional kind of a thing, too. So it would depend on not only overall capacity, but exactly where those events happen. And, you know, the uh, for example, the JBS plant in Sauterton, Pennsylvania is now closed, uh, I understand it completely. They were still killing cows, even though they had scaled back the Fed side of things. So, uh, you know, in some of those areas, uh, that's that's kind of the only choice in some cases. So it could have a pretty big impact uh, overall. Um, you know, as it, it'll depend on the timing uh, and how fast this happens um, over the next few months. On a broader scale, um, it's a little different because we're talking about cows on the one hand. If you look at overall cattle slaughter and particularly yearling slaughter, we're moving now towards the seasonal peak in those numbers. So as we go through April and May, uh, typically around the end of May, 1st of June, we will, or, you know, somewhere in there, June, we will be at the seasonal peak. So we're gonna have some uh, of the normal kind of seasonal pressure on our slaughter facilities. And again, anything that happens between now and then that sort of disrupts that uh, could set off a bit of a, a ripple effect that may stay with us for several weeks. Uh, speaking of the dairy industry, uh, one of the things that, that has really hurt it is milk consumption is really down nationally. And uh, then each one of uh, probably there's dairy associations, distribution associations in many of the states, and they've passed some regulations that have really protected their turf. And I know in North Dakota, where we're at up there, the dairies are really struggling. They're the only ones that can deliver some of these schools up there. And they had a piece of regulation that was passed years ago. And you can't take a big truck and, and drive it out in the country 40 miles and drop off a, a couple of uh, cases of pint milk and, and make any money. So there's got to be some things that happen uh, there along the line. And... Uh, Probably one of the reasons that uh, Dean Foods, uh, you know, for all practical purposes, went down, they had uh, made uh, a lot of acquisitions that were, and they were leveraged pretty heavily. And I think in the environment we're in, in the dairy uh, industry, I'm not sure that uh, with a declining market uh, and everything, I'm not sure they made some wise moves there. But things will stabilize, and there's no doubt there's going to be uh, some herd reduction out there. It just, it's not if it's going to happen, it's a matter of when. We continue to see daily in the news as they talk about numbers of positive cases. We know, for example, Grand Island, it's had an effect on the, on the JBS plant there. The fear of plant and processing disruptions, how is that playing into a factor in what we're seeing in the current prices? Well, I would, you know, I think that's a big driver in what we're seeing right now in the cash markets at this point in time, and certainly in the futures as well. Uh, that risk that we see that kind of disruption, obviously we went through that late last summer by losing one plant, 
this in some ways is actually more risky because uh, it, it could affect multiple plants at once, maybe not 100%, although it could be. It could be that we have to actually completely shut them down, uh, but it could certainly affect multiple plants at once. In fact, it already is to some extent. So I think that risk is one of the biggest uh, fears in the market right now uh, that's playing into those concerns over the coming uh, you know, next few weeks at least. You know, talking about Nebraska, they had a they had a list the other night of the states that are the heaviest uh, infected, and Nebraska is right down at the bottom, uh, number fifty. And I I don't know where we stand relative to the number of cases that have broken out here in the last few days, if that's significant or not. But I think we're probably in a good position where we live. On the other side of the coin, the concern is for workers that work in a plant like that, you really want to go to work when you know the virus is there. And you really don't know what to believe about the about the virus. And uh, you look at the very office, various offices and uh, companies out there. I mean, uh, you're you're forbidden to go in. You've got to pick your goods up, uh, you know, at the curbside. And uh, they've really taken some precautions. So I don't know how it would be to work in a plant where, you know, they've identified that 10, 15 people have the virus. I know I certainly wouldn't want to go to go to work. And uh, I'm not totally paranoid either you know <laughs> any other comments for anybody in that regard all right um, go, ahead. go ahead well i was just gonna say one of the other tricky things about that um you know we've got an issue with the demand side of the thing right right now with you know so much food service being down uh restaurants being closed etc um so the demand part of the equation is really challenging for a packing plant to figure out okay what's our throughput going to look like um, but with what's the issues with these that's going out of these plants right now is a lot of it is being employee driven where people are concerned about their own safety and wanting to go into work or not. And that's just a huge unknown as to how the plants are able to create a safe environment, how the employees respond. And it's just, you know, on the demand side and on the ability to keep these plants open and producing, uh, there's a human element that is very difficult to, to calibrate. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what kind of communication line there is between uh, the packing plants, the feedlots, probably the the producers out there. Uh, certainly good communication uh, can help overcome a lot of uh, evils that are out there. I don't know if, uh, uh, you know, what uh, the people in the feedlots know, uh, and I'm how, how do they plan their marketings? Uh, and I'm sure that uh, the cow-calf producer, the backgrounder and everything has got to do some, maybe a little different planning for this year along the line. But uh, communication out there is going to be uh, certainly important. And I don't know where it starts and where it ends. You know, um, the, really one of the issues, one of the reasons there's so much risk and fear in the market right now, really, is that we've got both demand and supply up in the air. We just talked about the fact that because of the, in the very near term, over some period of time here, that we don't really know what we're going to be able to produce uh, managing these plants. We know there's plenty of animals out there that need to come through these plants. Uh, so that's one issue. On the other side, we've been through this, uh, you know, incredible wave of demand, if you will. We shifted everything from food service, tried to get it over in grocery. That created the bottlenecks and the shortages that we had and the surge in consumer buying as they stocked up the freezers and so on. That's probably mostly done now. Uh, in terms of that surge in demand. And so, uh, and if they maintain those stocks, which I think they will, as long as we have the unknowns we have, then they go back to kind of normal turnover, if you will. So the uh, retail side probably moves back to uh, a little more normal side. And as long as the food service side is still shut down, relative to the last two or three weeks, that means demand softens a little bit going forward. And at some point in time, depending on, you know, whenever restaurants or the food service side is able to open back up, consumers are probably going to draw down those uh, those uh, stores that they've got. And so we could actually see, you know, even more weakness on the retail side for some period of time. And so we've created all of these uh, ripples in the market uh, that have different uh, implications and different different timing as we go forward. And some of it, we don't know the timing at all because we just don't know how things are going to play out over the next few weeks. So is the cut of the meat going to have stronger demand? For example, ground beef, is that going to become more 
of a sought after product or because we're getting into summer, we're going to get to grilling. Folks are going to want to be uncooped with cabin fever. Are they going to be looking for those those grilling options? You know, um, if if you look at wholesale uh, cuts over the last month, um, as we had this spike in the overall cutout, um, you had very different effects going on across the board. And in general, what has happened is we've had very strong demand for the end meat, so chuck and round products, largely because those uh, or to a, to a significant extent, because those get used for ground beef at the grocery store level, uh, in addition to just the kind of normal grocery store uh, set of products that they typically maintain. At the same time, if you look at things like tenderloins in particular, our most expensive wholesale cut has actually gone down over that same period through that spike in cutout because that's largely going through the food service side. So we've seen uh, you know, the, uh, the, the more expensive uh, tenderloins and ribeyes both have gone down over that time. Some of the uh, other steaks that are popular in, in either case, uh, you know, top sirloin, those kind of things have gone up a little bit. But you, but you are seeing very different impacts on different cuts of meat uh, through this process. And that, that there will be another backside of that wave again when we get to the point where we open food service back up again. I can speak a little bit to that. Uh, uh, the hamburger, I mean, has been, uh, we delivered a lot of hamburger to the retail stores that, that couldn't get any through the retail chain. Uh, your higher priced meats, your uh, middle meats and everything, uh, you know, that your high end restaurants are going to buy, like a Ruth's Chris, uh, the market on tenders uh, two weeks ago was like six, or uh, back the middle of February, it was like 1650 a pound. And the market today is six fifty a pound, and I mean it's uh, it's a giveaway price, and uh, you take your other cuts that are popular in food service, uh, the two inch slip ons, uh, the uh, New York strips, and I mean they're in the tank, and uh, hamburger is probably half the price uh, you know those cuts are, and food service has got its own probably its own uh, category of products uh, on the beef end that they sell that aren't sold in the retail end. And, and that's what really uh, screws the market up uh, bad. Oh, the, so, the fact is, Tom, just to follow on your point, we need all of these distribution channels, <clears throat> supply chain channels sort of working together. Uh, and, and when you have the restaurants now effectively shut down, I know we, we're still doing some business. My restaurant is still, still doing 15 to 20 percent of its normal sales, which, of course, is is uh, is really tough, you know, and I'm, I'm grateful for anybody uh, coming out and doing takeout or picking up takeout. So thank you for those folks that are are doing that. But the point is uh, the beef industry and producers absolutely need uh, the restaurant industry to get back up to up to speed in order for uh, us to really see a consistent demand uh, through the G beef channels. And I think it's really important for the producers listening to us to understand that that's not mo likely going to happen quickly. I mean, even if we said two weeks, you could open up the restaurant. I, I doubt if that's going to happen, but there's going to be, I think, some caution and I, I'm not sure people are going to run right back out into restaurants. And so the question is, how long will it take restaurants to come back up to speed or, or get anywhere close to normal? I, I'm sure we'll be way over 20 or 30 percent that we're doing in takeout. But, you know, this is likely not going to be a quick fix. And producers need to understand that our supply chain disruptions are going to continue for some months, I'm guessing, and and Daryl uh, and and Tom, I you know I, I I'm I'm not the expert, but I am a restaurant operator, and I kind of understand that what I sell, uh, I, I like to sell steaks and 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 those higher end cuts uh, as well as hamburger, of course. And right now, I'm not doing that. Yeah, you know, one of the things this really illustrates is is uh, is the fact that once we get to the point of of meat beef the meat. It, and, you know, economists actually created a problem. I have to confess here on behalf of my entire uh, profession, I guess, economists kind of created a problem because for years and years, we talked about beef demand like it was one thing. And, you know, if you go to the classroom, we draw that, you know, 
downward sloping demand curve. Beef is a bunch of different products. It's thousands of different products, actually, that go through those two channels of food service and, and retail grocery. And you do need both of them to have a, a sort of a mix mm-hmm. of that. And so beef is, is many different products, and they're all different markets. And, in fact, they interact with each other. You know, we like to talk about beef demand, and we always worry about what pork is doing and what poultry is doing. And those do matter. But when a consumer goes into the grocery store, to use that example, if you're looking for steak, you're going to look for whatever kind of steak you came in there for, but you're also going to check the other steaks and see if one of them's on sale or one of them looks better this this week or or whatever. The biggest substitute for a beef item most of the time is some other beef item. And so that makes this whole notion of beef demand a much more complex thing. And and again, we don't worry about it most of the time. We find homes for all of these products through the, the two market channels. But when you have this kind of disruption on either side, then it really creates problems. You were talking about ground beef a little bit ago, and, and the grocery store uh, ground beef demand has been through the roof, and you can't keep it in the on the shelves. And yet, at the same time, the food service decline is way bigger than that, even though the, the fast food places are still open for drive through and you'd think it might not have as big an impact on them, but in total – ground beef demand is way down. And so, uh, and we, again, tend to use different things. So the trimmings that normally go into food service type ground beef are in the tank right now, even though we've got this grocery store demand that's still driving ground beef in, in that other sector. Well, one, okay. of the other, go ahead. One, one of the other things that has happened with uh, the middle meats uh, in food service, uh, probably 80 to 85% of our sales are in uh, choice the top two thirds of choice and uh, very little in the, in the select category. And uh, I have a feeling my wife picks up some beef at uh, the grocery store now and then. I think that's probably where a big share of that goes. So I, I'm sure on, I'm sure on that end, uh, there's probably a surplus off the animal that uh, is not getting sold. And uh, you talked about though, uh, when things crank back up, and our industry's had a lot of conversation on that, I think when someone declares that the pandemic is over uh, and whatever that uh, will mean, uh, it'll probably be probably 30 days before the supply chain gets uh, gets filled again. And the frustration will be, you got uh, customers like Jim Jenkins that'll call for his number one uh, cut of meat. May not have it, may not yeah. have it for a couple of weeks. He's yeah, going to be open exactly. and his menu may not be full and complete. So that's a risk uh, the industry is going to run. We have a question coming from a producer in central Nebraska, and I'll just read it directly from his text message. It says, seems like we're importing a lot of beef now. Why are we learning about country of origin? And don't you think we should be trying to pop or prop up our own producers before we don't have any left? I'll take a shot at that before uh, if somebody else wants to. Again, it it goes to what I was just saying in terms of beef being lots of different products. So you have to be more specific than just looking at pounds of beef exported or imported or sent through one channel or another. Uh, So most of the beef that we do import is actually lean trimmings. Um, it, It serves kind of the same purpose that cow beef would serve in making ground beef for the most part. It's not all that, but but to a large extent. Uh, so, you know, um, we don't have the institutional demand right now uh, for ground beef or the, the food service demand for ground beef. So 50 percent lean trimmings, which come off of our our, our native fed steers and heifers. Uh, we need the lean to mix with that. And you, obviously you have to have the hamburger demand behind that in order to make those prices higher. So. Um, you know, if, if, if you don't have enough lean, then you wind up doing things that actually cost the industry money. We grind things that have other markets potentially. And so when we import product, we actually do a better job of utilizing the carcasses that we produce in the U.S. and, and producing the set of products that fits our market. Anybody else want to take a stab at that? Otherwise, I do have another question. Um, this one says, how do I look my children in the eye and say we might not be cattle producers a year from now? That'd be Tom? a tough one. That'd be yeah. a tough one. That'd be a tough one. You know, I, I, if I could just 
kind of speak as a small business person, and, and clearly this is very stressful. It's, it's stressful on, on all of us. This is one of the, the only time in my life that the whole country is being impacted. And I realize that some jobs and some people are less impacted than others, but uh, certainly agriculture is being impacted and certainly food service and, and small businesses. And when people can't get out and spend money, uh, it's a problem. So uh, my, my only response and the way I, as my wife and I talk about how we are going to fight our way through this uh, in the couple businesses that we own or are part owners in, We've just decided we're going to try to put together the best plan we can to reach out, help all the people we can. We sort of have to come together. And so I, I, I want to be careful because I, I, I don't want to lecture people. Uh, I've, been, I've been through some hard times in my life, both in the restaurant industry and the cattle industry. And I guess what I would say, uh, and I know it's cliche, but hard times don't last. Uh, uh, and but if you put together a plan and look at all the resources that are available and by resources, I'm talking about your banker who is, I think, going to work with people uh, more, more likely going to work hard. Uh, the banking industry is going to do everything they can. We have government programs out there. I don't know if they're going to be enough, but uh we know that there are, there are billions of dollars going to come toward the livestock sector. Se sector. I don't know if that's going to be enough. Uh, we've got brokers out there who have hedging and marketing strategies. And at some point before we end this evening, I, I, you know, I think we need to talk about utilizing some of this market volatility to, uh, you know, even if you're not very well hedged, there might be some opportunities to, to uh, protect some of your equity and you should do that. So I think we have to take a very holistic attitude that says, we're going to uh, look at all the resources you have and try to make your uh, system or your business stronger and come out of this stronger. And I, I recognize that, you know, some of us are in deeper than others and I would hope that we as a country and we as a society and we as uh, each community will rally around and figure out a way to come through this. And I, I guess if there's any message that I want to deliver tonight is that I do think we're resilient and uh, it's going to be painful, but uh, we can come out of this stronger. And, and believe me, when I say that, I'm still fearful about my restaurant business uh, without a doubt. I, 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 I am truly worried, but I, I, I'm going to do everything I can to take advantage of whatever resources are available to me to try to um, navigate through this crisis. I know this, you can't stick your head in the sand. And that's one, we need to, one reason we need to stay very intellectually engaged and, 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 and continue to look at the opportunities to uh, that are presenting themselves uh, of, of resources that are hopefully right in our community. Susan, we do have a I, I wanted to respond to that question, if I could. Yes. And then a comment that Jim made. And in looking at the stimulus package uh, that uh, will have an impact on the cattle industry, it looks like it's rather significant. And the thing that made me think it was significant, it's uh, $23.5 billion, and there was $9.5 billion that would go to individual producers, ranchers, farmers, probably every aspect of agriculture included, and then the rest of the CCC. And there's a limitation of $250,000 per applicant. Now, that leads me to believe that there's money out there, and, and that particular individual that asked the question, certainly you want to get with someone who knows uh, the loopholes on uh, getting to the federal government on that particular program. Granted, the rules may not be written yet, but I think for, uh, for every businessman that's out there, for every person that's been working for a wage, there's a program for them. And uh, the federal government and through the Federal Reserve, they want to be sure that there is 20, uh, plenty of money uh, in, in circulation.
And uh, they've dropped interest rates, as you know, down to basically nothing. Uh, they've engaged in some quantitative easing again now, and they're uh, buying mortgage-backed bonds, putting liquidity into the system. But the real beauty is, uh, from the standpoint of the banks, uh, and a lot of this came from the Dodd-Frank Act, they have taken and they've loosened up uh, – the regulation on the banks where they can make loans to people that might have been marginal in the past and uh, they're relaxing uh, their auto requirements apparently along that line. So I think for everyone out there that's got a need for money, I think there's an answer that lies somewhere in the stimulus packages that have been presented. And there's probably going to be a couple more that come along the line. So we do I, have some. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So, so I think there's some real hope there. We do have a lot of questions that are coming in on the chat, and one of them was, how much do we have in cold storage right now? Um, cold storage creates a lot of uh, confusion, I think, on the part of industry. Cold storage for meats is, uh, it's, first, it's defined as meat that's in some cold storage facility for at least 30 days. Uh, but if you look at cold storage and you recognize that it doesn't all go in or out at one time, it's in there for a long period of time, Cold storage actually represents a very small percentage on an annualized basis. If you kind of, uh, uh, you know, think about the throughput of, of cold storage, it's like two and a half percent of production. So and, it, and if it did all come out at once, it still would be, you know, a, 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 an impact for a week, maybe something like that. So cold storage is not a place where we're building up these huge stocks that are going to weigh on the market. Cold storage serves a couple of functions. A lot of it is really buffer of exports going out and imports coming in. So most of our exports go out as frozen. So they go into cold storage for some period of time as they're staging it for export. Stuff that is imported, those frozen trimmings that come in that go into ground beef come in and they may stay in cold storage for some period of time before they work their way into the system. So, um, so you know, cold storage, we watch those numbers because they do tell you a little bit about changing market conditions. But in and of themselves, cold storage is, is not a threat to the overall market situation. For the listeners on uh, KRVN and KTIC, that is the voice of Daryl Peel, an agricultural economist at Oklahoma State University. Next question comes, if the lean beef is there. Why is the killer market for the killer cow market? Any, I can't even read today. The lean beef is there. The killer cow market is there every day. And so is the supply chain so low? Why isn't the demand price higher? Confusion. I, I yeah, I don't that. quite understand that question. I'm trying to if process the, supply, the question. <laughs> yeah, if the supply chain is so low, why isn't the demand price so high? For not sure. That was just a question. I'm I'm wondering if it ties back to her comment about about the killer cow market. You know, again, we talked about the fact that we've had a surge in demand at the grocery store, including a lot of that was on ground beef. It's a very popular home item, right? It's very versatile. So people wanted ground beef there. The same time you had this, this massive decrease on the food service side, which is where a lot of that commercial ground beef goes. So all of the big fast food chains, that kind of thing. And so, so in the short run, we've got a tremendous loss of demand there on that side that is weighing on the trimmings market in particular. So if you look at 50% lean trimmings, um, which again, come from our feedlot cattle, but you have to mix additional lean with them to make ground beef. And we don't have the demand for that right now. So that price is very, is very low. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but it answers one that I know anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Another question is, says, Tom, is the imbalance of beef supply between retail and HRI in a better balance yet? You know, it's kind of hard. To, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, uh, we looked at it probably late last week and it was still still out of balance i think probably by this week uh, there'll there'll be a, ba a better balance on things uh and you're talking about cold storage i know we had a lot of fresh meat that uh you know we had uh on hand and after it gets so many days we'll put it in the freezer and we put quite a quite a bit of beef in the freezer uh but we're just a small very small piece of that pod uh 
But I think it'll be back in balance. And uh, certainly, as I indicated earlier, when uh, this pandem- pandemic is over, uh, there may be a- another little bit of a shock uh, uh, to retail and to food service there along that line. Yeah. So are the futures markets even giving a viable chance to hedge or manage the risk out there for the producer? This kind of, um, well, Mike, go ahead. Um, it's a, I mean, it's a really hard challenge right now. Um, you know, for a while here, leading into about January 21st, uh, the futures curve was strong across the board. Uh, beef demand has been, I mean, phenomenal over the last couple of years. So prices have been fantastic. Uh, and the board was reflecting that up and through about Jan- you know, January 21st or so. Um, what the board is designed to do is give an indication of what we see forward prices to be. So it's not trying to predict you know, where the cash market is today or where the cutout is today. It's looking forward and it's saying, what are the risks in front of us? What are the possibilities for higher prices or what are the possibilities for lower prices? And what I will say is that although the prices are lower, than they had been in months, even years, uh, there still is risk out there. Uh, Additionally, what I would say is that, you know, whether you're a feed yard or a stocker operation or cow-calf operation, um, the biggest and most important thing that you can do is have a forward-looking plan. You know, so as you have ownership of cattle, you have ownership of that risk, and you need to be forward-thinking and make a plan ahead of time. Um, so the question, you know, more directly, is there opportunity to manage risk right now? Uh, it's more challenging at lower prices. There's no d- doubt about that. But, you know, we were talking earlier when Jim was talking about things, you know, this takes grit and perseverance to get through on a human level. Um, burying your head in the sand is not really a viable option uh, from the production standpoint, nor is it from a risk standpoint. I think you've got to you've got to be proactive. Um, there's a lot of resources out there and they're daunting, uh, products sometimes when you think about some of the different options that are available to people, but it's something that's worth investing some time and energy to get to know. Yeah. You know, following up on that, I mean, there may be less overall opportunities to manage risk. I wouldn't say none. I think, and it depends on your situation and the type of operation we're talking about, but you know, your focus and Jim touched on this earlier, your focus has kind of shift a little bit in the short run, at least from risk management to financial management. Absolutely. You're trying to figure out a plan to figure out how this is not your last year in the cattle business to address the earlier question. So, you you know, you kind of shift your focus now to financial management. You draw on those resources. Obviously, we're on defense now. We're not on offense. So it's not a question of how good a year can we make this. It's how can we make sure this isn't the last year for us, at least for some people. That's the situation. And, and you know, again, you, you have to do that. There will be opportunities. There will be opportunities on the backside of this thing going up. Uh, at some point. We don't know when that's going to happen, um, but at some point in time, uh, there, there will be some opportunities there. And we have, follow- to- oh, go ahead. we have a follow-up question, I think, that, Mike, you can answer for this gentleman. Cole is wondering, is there any good books, classes, or resources so he can learn more about hedging? Uh, absolutely. There's a ton of them. Um, CH actually has a website. It's free to the public. Uh, it's beefmargin.com. Um, there's tutorials. There's lessons. There's you name it, um, you know, whatever you're looking for, you can find on that as well. Um, I would imagine that the CME has some online resources that are accessible. Um, as far as books go, um, let me think about that. I'll come back to that. I'm not thinking of a really good one off the top of my head, um, but I'll come up with one. So let me, let me- Go ahead. I was just I was just going to say that, you know, I got to put in a plug for the extension service. So whatever state you're in, you've got extension resources. Right. Draw on those. You have people who can help teach uh, in, in one form or another the basics of, of these risk uh, management strategies and, and a variety of other things, financial management. Uh, so utilize those resources. That's what they're there for. Susan, I, just to follow on uh, as a producer, and as a person going back maybe 10, 12 years, I did not do much hedging or any hedging. And then we hit 2012 when corn prices went, to, because of a drought and other things, went to 8 or $9. And then, of course, in 2016, we had the cattle market collapse. Uh, and, and then last summer, of course, we had the Holcomb fire, the Tyson fire, which 
took feeder cattle down, I don't know, 30, 35 bucks, you know, within a few weeks. And now we have this. And I would just, I, I know hedging uh, futures and options, it, it's complicated. Uh, and believe me, as a person who thinks he's reasonably intelligent, I, 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 I can tell you that it's been a struggle uh, over the years to sort of develop uh, a plan using uh, the tools available. But I would encourage you as a producer that if you're not using the tools that are out there uh, that many brokers uh, uh, can, can provide you with in terms of using options and futures, they need to be a part of your repertoire. If you're going to make your business, your cattle business more resilient and able to stand up to these black swan events, which seem to be happening more and more often, and that, that may not go on this way, I certainly hope it doesn't, I, I think that you have to, you, you, none of us would not insure our car or our house. Most of us even insure our life uh, for our family's benefit. Why would we not try to put some insurance in place for hundreds of thousands of dollars or in many cases, millions of dollars of livestock investment we have? I know it's hard. It's somewhat complicated, but there are professionals out there, such as Mike, who can work with you to develop a plan. And, and, and I make this point because it's become kind of a passion of mine and, and in that everyone, even small producers, should be doing more risk management than they're doing. Well, another question coming from the chat. What can we do about the packers making so much and the feedlot producers losing so much? Well, we talked earlier about, you know, these short run conditions and the separation between immediate market conditions and expectations for the future. Mike talked about the fact that the future's job is to anticipate what is coming at us and the risks we face in the future. And so when you get a situation like we've had, um, you know, we, we can get things uh, for very lo logical market reasons going different directions for a short period of time. Um, they are connected over a longer period of time, but in the short run, they, they aren't necessarily. We had completely different uh, dynamics going on on the food side in terms of meat demand versus what was going on in the cattle market. So, uh, so I think, you know, one of the things I would say here is that as we think about, you know, whether there's problems in the market, we got to make sure we really understand how markets work. Uh, now, clearly, oversight is, is not a bad thing. I mean, obviously, we, you know, we have regular, regular uh, regulators and regulatory processes that need to happen just to make sure nothing nefarious is going on. But before you go down that road of, of assuming that just because we see a short run market disconnect, that that means that's happening. I think you have to really understand, um, you know, markets are kind of like your car. You don't have to know how they work as long as they're running. But when they break down, you really need to understand how they work. And, and, and I think that's what we've seen. We saw it last summer with the Holcomb fire. We've seen it again this time in terms of really understanding how markets do what they do to fix these kinds of shocks. Um, and then beyond that, there's a question of whether there's anything else going on that we need to address in some other mechanism. Right, but the you know, like you said, Daryl, the the exchange is forward looking. Um, if you look at what's happened to our cash market over the last three weeks, we've gone from a one nineteen average to a one eleven one eleven average to one oh five trading this week. I mean the the decline in price, which is matching up with the decline that we're seeing in demand and inability to move product through the pipeline, um, is being reflected by the board. And you know, a lot of people question that mechanism. And I, I know you're a um, you understand how it works and what it's doing looking forward, but it's just, it's a, you know, it's a trying to send a signal to everybody that we are going to, you know, have a difficult stretch ahead of us. Now it may be an overshoot currently. It may be an undershoot shoot currently, but it's not a broken system. Yeah. I, you know, again, a couple things there. One is if you, you know, the, the concern on the box beef side, which people translate into quick and dirty estimates of Packer margins. You know, we shot up to 257, I think briefly on choice cutout. Mm -hmm. We're back down today to 222. 
Right. It, went, it went up 19% in a matter of three days. And that had nothing really to do with anything except the fact that there was this bottleneck of trying to meet this unexpected surge at the grocery store and the logistics of trying to move meat around. And, and the market's already fixing that. The, the, the futures market and even the cash fed cattle market to a large extent, as you said, Mike, is really looking beyond that almost from the beginning because they recognize that's in a very immediate short term thing. And, and beyond that, we've got these other issues. We're worried about packing plants closing and obviously we're worried about the general economy and, and we don't know. And and as you said, markets do sometimes overshoot to some extent, especially on the future side. That's their job is to sort of anticipate the worst case scenario. Um, and, you know, quite often it turns out that we don't actually go to that and, and we should be happy about that. But it does mean there's a period of time where the market kind of uh, goes overshoots a little bit, overreacts, if you want to call it that. Um, but it's really trying to assess uh, that risk properly. Mm -hmm. We uh, talked about this kind of at the beginning, the top of the hour, about uh, Senator Sass urging the CFTC to fight market manipulation. A question from the chat says, does anybody on the panel believe that the big four packing companies are manipulating the market? Uh, I do not believe that. I believe that, um, you know, for every buyer, there has to be a seller in an exchange environment. Um, you know, frankly, looking forward, with so business hates a lack of clarity, individuals hate a lack of clarity, and all we have in front of us is a lack of clarity right now. So to establish a trade on the exchange, uh, either long or short, you've got to find a counterparty that's willing to take the exact opposite position. And frankly, with the amount of uncertainty that we have in front of us, uh, cut out values that are swinging $30 in a week, uh, cash prices that are moving $15 over two weeks, there's just a very, small amount of willingness uh, to participate. And we're seeing that across all members of the trading community. Uh, managed fund positions are down, hedging positions are down, um, producer positions are down. Everybody is cutting back on risk because of that uncertainty. And so that will lead to a lot more volatility in, two, in both directions. And I think, you know, usually when people are questioning the exchange mechanism, it's during a time of turmoil and yeah. You know, exactly. it's it's hard. I mean, it's it's hard for everybody. Part of, you know, I work on a daily basis uh, speaking with producers, trying to help them come up with a game plan. And, you know, we'll spend 30 minutes talking about market fundamentals and what strategies work the best. And lately, you know, there's 15 minutes talking through life in general, you know, just trying to get on a human level through the day. It's exactly. it's taxing for everybody. Um but I think that that lack of clarity and the uncertainty that everybody's seeing is, is leading to that volatility. But I do not think they're mar manipulated markets. Susan, if I could just follow on briefly, um, I, I think that our government regulators need to be paying attention and looking for any evidence out there that there's manipulation. Uh, but I would also say that uh, too often, and this is just my opinion, I'm, uh, I think uh, too often, some of my producer friends, and I, they are truly my friends, believe the packer is causing all the problems when, in fact, there are larger issues out there, supply and demand issues that generally function pretty well. You know, back in 2016, when the market crashed, uh, uh, we had a huge number of cattle uh, come onto the globe, onto the, onto the world stage because prices were really high. We were making two, three, four hundred bucks, some cow calf producers back in that 2014 to 2015 stretch were making five and six, seven hundred bucks a head. And that brought a lot of cattle onto the market. And eventually when you put enough cattle on the market, markets are going to go down. My point is not that we should not be very vigilant about any sort of improprieties out there, but I think too often we focus too much attention on the packer manipulating markets and not enough attention on actually using tools that we have in our toolbox to actually avert or avoid or mitigate that risk. And believe me, at one point, I was that person. I, I know what it is like to be in a downturn and not be properly hedged. And that's why 
in the last several years, thank goodness, I have used hedging to my advantage. Now, whether I was hedged enough right now, uh, I can tell you uh, that may not be, you know, I, I may not still be hedged enough, but at least I have some equity because of that hedging. Well, we do have another I think, um, Go ahead, Mike. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say one of the other issues when it comes to that is, you know, there's an issue within the price discovery mechanism in the in the physical space. So, you know, we've seen continually the amount of negotiated traded cattle dropping off substantially. The same thing is happening in the in the pork business. Um, you know, without proper price discovery and um, a robust market in trading cattle with the packers, you know, you're going to have a hard time closing that gap between the cutout and the cash, which is, I think, a big problem. Greg is wondering, Mike, what are your thoughts on the influence of the algos on the futures market in comparison to the fundamental market factors? Um, so the algos are always uh, a big discussion in down markets as well. Um, you know, trying to define what that means is challenging for people, I think. Um, a lot of algo markets or algo trading systems uh, are market making systems. So what that means is if you have five different sell orders come into the marketplace, you need somebody to take on a buy on all five of those trades. Um, what an algo will do is buy a contract and then turn around and trade it somewhere else automatically. So you might buy an April contract and turn around and sell an August contract. Now, there's a lot more advanced algos as well. Um, but honestly, you know, at the end of the day, I believe that algos can help to slow down moves in certain instances. I think they can accentuate moves in certain instances, but ultimately the fundamentals drive the market. All right. Um, another question here is, is there a fear of cattle getting too fat with everything that's happening with plants closing shifts and slowing down? I guess I'll yeah. take a crack at that, Mike. Uh, the others may have a, a thought as well. You know, one of the things that we've been watching all year is the fact that these carcass weights are way above last year. We had a couple of years where we moderated them uh, a, a bit. And then all of a sudden, really late last year, these carcass weights started to really shoot up. We've, you know, and you can you can talk about weather conditions and feeding conditions and all of that. That's part of it through the winter, especially. Um, but it's also more fundamental than that. Um, and so and then we, you know, when you lay that, uh, lay on top of that now, this current situation with the threat that we could see um, processing slowdowns and so on, uh, I think there is a significant risk that we take what was already projected to be a record amount of beef in 2020 uh, in this country, an all-time record, uh, and, and the cattle numbers are not going to change a lot. We may change the timing. We may have to change the timing a bit, uh, but the overall numbers are not going to change that much. But these carcass weights could have a significant impact on, uh, on the total amount of beef that we wind up producing and the amount of pressure that we put on the market, at least certainly at some times of the year. Uh, the problems with the carcass weights uh, really uh, have impacted – you know, the food service industry, uh, when the carcass weights got real heavy, uh, probably the standard for a 12-inch uh, New York strip, one inch thick, comes off of a 13, 1,300-pound animal, somewhere in that range, give 40, 50 pounds either direction. When the carcass weights got up real heavy, uh, you take a one-inch cut, and you might have 15, 16 ounces of meat. And you take the way a restaurant prices the meat, uh, it took the price point too high and people took it off the menu. And then there were other folks that would cut cut uh, the uh, New York strip a lot thinner. And, uh, and it was just like taking a slice and roast beef. Uh, you take, uh, you take uh, uh, the tenders, you take uh, the ribeyes. And uh, so that's a real danger you run into. Uh, it used to be, and Jim could probably speak to that, most of your uh, discriminating restauranteurs would have two or three fancy cuts of meat on the, on the menu, and they don't anymore. And that's the risk you take when the carcass weights get too heavy. We've done some research at Oklahoma State specifically looking at that very issue in terms of, of bigger carcass weights lead to bigger product weights, 
bigger cuts. And, and it is a negative impact on demand for exactly the reasons that you just described, Tom. Uh, if these stakes get too big, you either have to cut them thinner, which is not what you want for a high quality steak, uh, or you know you, you you wind up doing other contortions to get that price point where it works and if you know and it really doesn't matter it's actually a problem in the in the grocery stores we don't hear about it as much but it, it's it's certainly at the restaurant level you know you're it, it's it's you're thinking in terms of a plate cost um, you know restaurants aren't worried about price per pound as much as they are about what that plate cost that's right. what the consumer's going to see that's what's going to drive it same thing's true at the grocery store it's package cost that really matters and not only that in a grocery store you've got limited space for these uh, things you got to put bigger stakes on bigger bigger trays you can't put as many of them out so you wind up with more labor involved and restocking shelves not to mention managing that price point so there's a lot of issues with these uh, bigger carcass weights that are a little more longer term and fundamental in nature than the immediate market impacts we might be talking about another question coming from the chat and it's been um, asked a couple different times and i'm reading this word for word explain to this to me how could the beef industry work for years been feeding for 50 years could hardly do anything wrong. Last five years, all goes to hell. Explain, please. <laughs> um, I'll say a few things about that. We had a tremendous run-up in price and profitability. Uh, we had two drought years, 2012, 2013, that led to a tremendous rally in 2014. Um, as Jim mentioned earlier, that huge amount of profitability, it creates incentives for people to grow the herd. And we've seen a substantial growth in our herd over the last five years. Um, that constriction in supply in 2014 was pronounced, so it pushed us up to a tremendous uh, level that we wouldn't have, you know, fundamentals wouldn't suggest that we would go that high. Exactly. And then with this growth that we've had, the fall has been, you know, as astounding. You know, cash cattle prices went from 174 down to 98 on our lows uh, in about, what, a year and a half? So the volatility has been staggering, um, but I wouldn't say that it's, you know, quote unquote, gone to hell in the last five years. Um, it's been incredibly challenging. Managing that kind of volatility for anybody is incredibly challenging. Um, but I'm long term incredibly bullish on this business. Um, this is going to be a really rough patch for everybody, but the product that is produced in this country is phenomenal. Um, the improvements in, you know, animal welfare, everything that we're doing is is spot on as far as what we're able to produce and the world wants it. Um, you know, our export markets have been up until this point growing and continuing to grow and we've got all the resources here to continue doing that. So um, yeah, it's been incredibly challenging, but I would not, that's not how I would categorize this situation at all. Yeah, I guess you, know, we, you brought up the export markets. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity that was there before this started, and it's still there. Um, we're going to go through some some bumps. We've had some logistics in the export markets as well. Really started in China in January when the uh, when the coronavirus hit there initially. Uh, they shut down the country. The ports got backed up. There was no flow of product in and out. And those are slowly coming back online and so on. Uh, but the other side of it is that there's tremendous potential there. And, of course, there's this little issue of the African swine fever, uh, particularly in China, but in many other countries as well, which has created a worldwide protein deficit. Uh, pork is obviously their favorite meat, and, and we're counting on exporting record pork levels from the U.S. there. And we're seeing that. But we're also hoping that beef uh, goes along with that, and there's tremendous potential there. Uh, the most recent trade data that we actually have for the month of February uh, was actually very, very bullish, very promising in terms of being up, particularly to our two biggest beef export markets, uh, Japan and South Korea. So, um, again, for whatever we have to go through here for the next few months till we get past this thing, um, there is a lot of potential underneath that. And and that was there. It was there long term and it and it hasn't gone away. That's still going to be there when we get through this. Daryl, it kind of follows, uh, follows up with a question that Paul had. He said, prior to the worldwide pandemic, many of us were looking at ASF situation in China. That will lead to 10 years of pork shortages there. Looking further down the road, in the still the big opportunity, is there still some big opportunities for U.S. cattlemen? Especially we know that China has been looking at reviewing their implants in rectopamine, for example. If you look at China by itself in the last uh, four years, very rapidly, they went, well, really, if you go back seven or eight years, 
they were not a, a, pl- a player at all. They did not show up on any chart relative to trade of beef in a, on a global sense. Now, they've been for many, many years one of the biggest beef producers and consumers, but it was all internal, whatever they did in their domestic market. They're just such a big country that even though they don't eat a lot of beef per capita, there's so many of them that it was a, a big total amount. But that, uh, that per capita consumption has started to, in the last few years, really expand beyond their domestic production. And so very quickly, they became the, the biggest beef importing country in the world. The U.S. has never had much of a presence in China, but there is enormous potential there. There are some logistics issues and still some political issues in terms of access uh, as we address some of these things like the uh, sanitary, phytosanitary things. But in total, there's tremendous opportunity there. Uh, right now, it's being met by other places in the world, but I think, and it will take some time for them to develop a market for our particular type of beef, but, uh, but there is tremendous potential there. A follow-up question to the past five years. This comes from Lynn. It says, to that question of the past five years, since electronic trade and void of antitrust laws that has no bearing on profitability, and why no transparency? Um, I would say one of the things that honestly has been the most challenging over the last five years is the decline in negotiated trade. Um, I don't know, Daryl, and the rest of you guys, what you think about that. But, um, you know, when Packers are in a situation where the vast majority of their inventory is handed into them on a, on a you know, daily or weekly basis, and they don't have to Supply, uh, you start to see breakdowns in that price discovery mechanism. I think, to me, the biggest challenge that we've seen as an industry and continue to face and, and need to come up with solutions for is that price discovery system. And I think the last five years it's been a pronounced trend in one direction. I agree. I think uh, we need transparency. Uh, there's too many uh, concerns about market, market manipulation, and either we need to find solutions or we need to uh, uh, at least explain what's going on better uh, if there's not a problem there. And so my thought is let's use this situation, this crisis, to uh, better explain to producers who are the keystone, the foundation, What's going on? Put more transparency. I don't have the answers. I'm a layperson, but I, I know that uh, having less than 20% negotiated trade each month or each, I'm sorry, uh, each week, and a lot of that trade is done after the market closes uh, on Friday afternoon. I, I, I think there, there's a few things that we could do a lot better in, in, and figure out a solution to. What do you guys see the export market looking as we move forward? Uh, again, I talked about that a little bit. Um, now, again, the next few months, I think, is a little bit iffy just because there's a lot of, uh, you know, this is a pandemic. It's affecting many places in the world. Fortunately, it's actually not as big a deal in, uh, from a beef standpoint in Japan and South Korea, which are our two biggest markets. Uh, but that said, um, you know, our, our major trading partners include Mexico and Canada to the north and south of us. Uh, there's, there's, you know, some concerns there. And again, the, the, the China situation, which for beef really represents potential. Uh, the, the biggest frustration we've had over the last couple of years between, uh, you know, between trade wars and, and now this event and so on is that we've just really been slow to sort of get started with the process of developing a market. Um, you know, when, when anytime you're talking about international trade, there's sort of a couple stages. The first one is the political stage. You got to get the countries politically to agree on access and various things that, that uh, sort of allow it to potentially take place. Then the economics kicks in in terms of what is the real market potential there. Uh, again, beef is many different products. And so we're not going to sell everything in China. I've spent a little bit of time over there, about a month, a couple of years ago, and uh, and I didn't eat very, very much beef. They just don't eat a lot, and it's not a place where you're going to sell a lot of boxes of steaks initially. Uh, maybe someday, but, you know, it's a different style of cooking. It's a different style of product, different preferences. We've got to figure all those things out because we've never had that market. Once we do, and I think we will, um, there's tremendous potential there. 
Mexico <laughs> started much the same way about 30 years ago, where we had very specific little niche markets that we were able to export into. It's grown into a much more broad-based, robust uh, market for us, but it took a long time to do. So it's going to it's going to take some time. Susan. We yes. had a group uh, from Brazil uh, up here in Nebraska. They started out with uh, with some – they flew into Denver, and they spent some time with some feedlots west of us, spent some time at Tice, and then they came down here and spent about a half a day with us. And we pulled out cuts of meat. We had our chef down here demonstrating. And uh, they had uh, a USDA representative uh, lives in Sao Paulo, Brazil, that uh, accompanied them. And uh, they certainly recognize that our beef is best, and they would like to import more. Uh, their big, uh, the countries they imp import this beef from is Argentina and uh, and uh, India, and they really, really import a ton of beef from India. And uh, by the time we were done our conversations, there were two two things I was thinking about. Number one, uh, I there were tariffs they were talking about, and really didn't get a lot of clarity on that. Uh, they spoke English, but sometimes it wasn't the best English. And the other thing was the strength of the dollar. And those happened to be, you know, two things that I think uh, would preclude them from probably importing more of our beef. But they certainly have an interest uh, in the quality of the beef that we raise uh, in this area. And, uh, I mean, we all know it's, uh, it's the best in the world. At, at the current time, the strength of the dollar is a real headwind for us uh, and liable to be for some time to come. And that's, you know, again, those are the kind of short term things that we look at on top of the underlying sort of uh, market forces that are at play. A question from Bonita says, uh, it is my understanding that we have um, the beef inventory. Can you talk a little bit more about why retail shelves are empty and is there a distribution issue? Very much a distribution issue. Uh, Tom will talk about this as well. You know, again, he, he gave these numbers earlier, but I'll repeat them quickly here. Uh, food consumption in the U.S., food expenditures is about 54% food service currently, or at least it was, and about 46% uh, retail groceries, almost half and half. And almost immediately we shoved the majority or a big chunk of the food service <coughs> side onto the retail grocery side. Um, and what you have to understand is that those are very different supply chains. I'm going to let uh, Tom talk about that, but the same people who supply grocery stores typically do not supply or uh, food service. And so you can't immediately, um, if, in, if indeed at all, switch those supplies uh, from one side to the other. Boy, you hit the nail on the head there. Um, we uh, we do supply some grocery stores, probably with uh, and some small chains, and uh, and of course probably the big category is a hamburger. And uh, I would dare to say that uh, probably the cuts of beef that you sell in uh, the food service side is probably all the the higher grades. And uh, and in the retail side, uh, I think that's probably more of a select market there. Uh, one of the other factors, though, uh, is as a food service distributor, our goal is to have a 99% fill rate to our customers. That means for every 100 items to purchase, we want a 99% fill rate. And our fill rate is a function of the fill rate we get from our vendors. And our vendors on beef uh you have to have multiple suppliers. We may have a rate of 80%, 85% from uh, one of the packers one week, and uh, and we've got to fill in uh, and backfill from some other, some other suppliers. And uh, so it's difficult with a, with a beef end in particular. Uh, discriminating operators will want uh, a certain, uh, certain grade. They'll want a certain label on it, and uh, you try and maintain that all the time. But to fill in around uh, your outs, uh, you've got to have multiple suppliers on uh, on beef, and that's kind of frustrating. Well, we're getting down towards the end. It's about 21 minutes after 7. One quick question before we wrap it up. Many producer groups are calling for an increase in negotiated transactions for fed cattle to improve markets. Will that help? Well, Jim will probably talk about this too, but, you know, uh, again, 
I, I think we, and Mike as well, I think we would agree that, that we would like to see that. Um, but the other side of that is you have to ask yourself, why did it change? Why do we not have it? There are reasons for that. Um, and, it, and it does involve both sides. As Mike alluded to earlier, uh, it takes two sides on these deals. So, uh, so I, you know, I think if you want to try to fix that problem, you have to really understand why we have that issue um, and, and certainly have that in mind uh, as you think about any uh, sort of solutions that we might propose to that, um, because a lot of things in the market work really well. Uh, there may be some things that don't work as well as we'd like to, but I think it's very critical if we believe in the market system that we uh, understand how it works so that when we try to solution, you know, fix one problem, we don't create some others inadvertently. Hmm. Yeah, I don't believe it should be mandated by government how much cash cattle is traded. Um, I think naturally between the producer and the packer, there is a bit of an adversarial relationship, right? They're on opposite sides of a transaction, but I think they're do, they do need to come together some to figure out how we can better market cattle. Uh, as Daryl said, it's hard. There's a reason why we don't trade as much cash cattle. Uh, producers that produce a higher quality product want to be paid premiums for that. And so that has led to a lot of that, that change in the, the way that the, the cattle are traded. But, um, you know, with all this, with being in such a hard time that we're in, I think people just have to work together to some extent, and that includes the Packer. Uh, you know, uh, one thought, uh, in just reflecting on this a little bit, probably in we're involved really in two or three different industries. Uh, and I mentioned convenience products, uh, also equipment, supplies, and then food service. In each one of those industries, there are purchasing consortiums and there's sales consortiums. And uh, I think in probably the beef industry and some of the beef uh, suppliers belong to some of these or they will sell to some of these consortiums. But I can see a consortium of feeders. I can see a consortium of growers. And, uh, you know, uh, you really need scale in any industry out there today to be successful. And that might be part of the solution, uh, you know, to the, to the problem. Uh, in agriculture, especially, you find uh, a lot of independently minded people. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm not being critical of, of anyone, but a group of 10 in the room, and uh, they might be on the same wavelength on maybe a half a dozen issues. And uh, when you're talking about consortiums out there that buy and sell, uh, you know, one thing about it is you expect each one of those consortiums expect a commitment from every one of their members. And uh, that might be something that uh, might work uh, in this industry. Uh, certainly, you mentioned transparent transparency, uh, and there's got to be good, concise communication and controlling supply and demand, uh, doing some forecasting and having an outlook into the future that tells you really what you need to be doing. Uh, those are things you can accomplish very easily. And then especially when you go to the export market, uh, I think there are things that could happen. I don't know if you can build a consensus with a group uh, anyone uh, in that particular level of supply chain, but uh, it would be interesting uh, to see if it could be done. Let's get one more question, and hopefully two before we have to wrap this up. Jay has asked a couple times, would be curious uh, what uh, Professor Peel feels about the trend towards less negotiated trade. Daryl? Um, well, again, I think we just talked about that to some extent. Um, you know, we've seen it go down as an economist and as a, you know, as somebody involved in, in research. Uh, it is a, a topic that, that economics research gets done on. We call it thin markets uh, research. And, and the proverbial question there, and any time you're looking at this, is sort of how thin is too thin? And, and the answer to that depends on the market, depends on the situation and so on. And, and so there's not one blanket answer, unfortunately. It is something that's been looked at from a research standpoint, uh, for, you know, amongst the, uh, the economics uh, community and it, and still is an ongoing thing. And so, and I think, you know, we recognize that we're, uh, some people clearly think we're over that line. 
Um, if we're not over it, we are, you know, pushing our limit in some cases. So, um, you know, it's, it's an ongoing issue and, we, and it is something that is being looked at. All right. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much uh, to Daryl Peel, Mike Maroney, Tom Henning, and of course, Jim Jenkins, the the brainchild behind this last <laughs> hour and a half. <laughs> it is much appreciated. And I apologize to the, all the questions that we did not get to. Some great thought provoking comments as you guys had discussions as well, bringing up different topics and, and discussions. And I've even seen a few producers reaching out, gentlemen, saying, hey, I've done this or I've learned how to market this way, get in touch with me on Facebook and they're exchanging some social media. So again, some good thought provoking ideas happening, maybe some things that we can see working in and working towards the future. And hopefully fingers crossed, we can finish out this week with a, with a positive note as we head into the Easter holiday. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Yep. Thank you for all of you joining this panel. I'm grateful to, be able to participate. My pleasure. And with that being said to all our listeners on KRVN and KTIC, thank you as well for taking time out of your day to listen to the guys. I received messages popping up through social media. They're listening while they're checking cows and calves. Thank you as well. And thank you to what everybody does on an everyday basis, because without you, we would all be starving and unfortunately be naked as well. So with that being said, thank you, agriculture. Brighter days are yet to come. Have a very happy Easter, and thanks for joining us this last hour and a half. Good night, happy everybody. Happy Easter to all of you. Yeah, good, good night. night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night.